What's going on, everybody? I know that some of you have an interest in Spangler, Oswald Spangler's Decline of the West. And I was thumbing through, sorry, that is so dusty, Heidegger's Ponderings 7 to 11. And Ponderings is the Black Notebooks, okay? That's the way that they're translated or the title that they got in English. And uh, I saw here some passages on Spangler that I thought I would share with you in case you find them interesting. The way that I'm going to do this, it's out of context. We are not going to go over the whole book, but I'm just going to launch into this, read it, and we'll see if you find it interesting. Spangler, Heidegger writes, in him, Nietzsche's inversion of Platonism becomes the mere sovereignty of mere facts over and against the impotence of truths, which for Spangler means the generalities of mere opinion. For Heidegger, Nietzsche inverts Platonism. Plato establishes being as more important than becoming, and therefore in the cave allegory, what does it mean to go out of the cave? It means to turn the soul around from the things that are becoming to the things that truly are. Being gets precedence over becoming, as it were. And for Heidegger, in a nutshell, Nietzsche inverts Platonism and puts becoming in the forefront. And yet, inverting Plato is not the same as overcoming Plato, which is what Heidegger seeks to do. So Nietzsche, for Heidegger, is an inversion of Plato. And in Spangler, Nietzsche's inversion of Platonism takes on the form of the sovereignty of facts over truths. The glorification of facts, Heidegger continues, which perhaps presents the most bleak and at the same time most blind romanticism, although the latter is for Spangler highly contemptible, leads ultimately to an extolling of Rome and Caesar. This is a unilateral Nietzsche, merely taken more historiologically, I'll tell you what that means in a minute, and decisively than the biological and swampy Nietzsche of Clages, another reader or interpreter. So historiologically, I should tell you very briefly what that means. Historiologically, for Heidegger in the English translations as a rule, means having to do with, as it were, recorded history of deeds from the past. It's in contrast to history, historiology and history. Historiology, the recorded deeds of the past that we make useful for ourselves in the present. But history is the genuine unfolding essence of being itself sort of two different realms. And Heidegger tries to give us an understanding of history as the genuine unfolding of being itself. But he recognizes that often these other authors are thinking historiologically in a calculating way about the recorded past. So in Spangler, the historiological approach to Nietzsche extols Rome and Caesar. It would be fruitless to start by ferreting out Spangler's self-contradictions, Heidegger writes, his blindness toward that which nevertheless confers a power to shock on his presentations and on his alleged experiences, which are indeed merely extracted from the historiological literature, is permanent. His blindness is permanent. For Heidegger, Spangler has a blindness that it, you can't do away with. Spangler can be taken only the way he must be taken according to his own doctrine. We apply what Spangler said to himself. And what do we get? We get him as a symptom of his era. An era he, of course, sees only from his own perspective, which he maintains as the absolute perspective. In Spangler's doctrine, Heidegger continues, neither pessimism nor relativism nor zoologism, and here he quotes Spangler, quote, humanity is for me a zoological greatness, unquote, is the danger. Neither pessimism, nor relativism, nor zoologism is the danger for Spangler, according to Heidegger. Here, nothing at all is dangerous anymore. There's only the very fixed consistency of succession, whereby the rudest slap in the face no longer has any meaning, since everything merely comes down to the operation of facts and their fadedness. Kind of a calculable process of facts and their fate, the consistency of succession. The entire 19th century, quoting, 
does not contain one single question which scholasticism had not already discovered, thought through, and brought into an illustrious form as one of its own problems. That's Heidegger quoting Spangler. The 19th century does not contain one single question which scholasticism had not already discovered, thought through, and brought into illustrious form as one of its own problems. Now Heidegger continues commenting. Spangler's enthusiasm for facts seems to stop here. For otherwise, he would have to know, yet what is knowledge for a scribe of facts, that scholasticism not only was completely unfamiliar with any problems, but was even so far removed from the 19th century, so different, that it never could have chanced upon the problems of that century. This is Heidegger saying Spangler is clueless when he says that scholasticism discovered the problems of the 19th century. Such statements of Spangler's, like the one just cited, may make an impression on unknowledgeable people of facts, like technicians and bank directors, is what Heidegger writes, and they may be recorded with a smirk by chaplains trained in apologetics, but they indeed merely demonstrate the ahistoricality of this prototype of all contemporary historiologists. Before all else stands this statement, quote, there is actually, excuse me, there is no actually new thought in so late a time. End quote. Heidegger quoting Spangler. There is no actually new thought in so late a time. What amazing honesty and modesty. Yet what immediately follows are enumerations, many lines long, of what Spangler has created as new. But the self-contradiction, it does present itself so crudely, is here without the self-contradiction being Spangler on one hand saying there's nothing new, and on the other hand, supposedly offering something new. The self-contradiction, which does present itself so crudely, is here without significance, for it is proper to this sort of philosophy, which surrenders to facts, to beings, insofar as something like that can at all be conceded to it. All right, so he says it's a self-contradiction, but it's not even worth noting how brutal it is because this whole project is not philosophical. It's a capitulation to facts poorly thought through. What is a fact and what is thinking? Continuing. This complete immersion in Platonism, that it is an inverted Platonism, makes no essential difference, Heidegger writes. Another key thing here. You may, the Nietzscheans among you, believe that you can get away from Plato and Platonism by inverting Plato and Platonism. But for Heidegger, the inversion is not an essential difference. Therefore, whether you're pro-Plato or anti-Plato is not what's crucial here. And Heidegger in his other writings gives us a sense of what it would mean to overcome Plato and not just to oppose or invert. So again, we look here and we see that he's accusing Spangler of a vulgar version of Nietzsche's inverted Platonism. And this complete immersion, this ignorant proclamation of the abandonment of beings by being, so we no longer have to think about being, we're just left with beings, with all the facts, with all the doings, with everything that can be recorded historiologically. We've totally lost from sight this other realm or dimension. This ignorant proclamation removes from or better denies this way of thinking, Spangler's, any dangerousness. Consistent with this innocuousness is then the strategy to take as an opponent, in each case only something weak, ordinary, supplementary, and uncreative. One derides inconsequential academic philosophy and yet remains oblivious to even the very first presuppositions of, for example, a confrontation with Kant. Even here, Heidegger continues, Spangler is a worsened edition of a unilateral Nietzsche. Spangler's Nietzscheanism doesn't even understand something like what it would mean to think about Kant. What is at least astonishing, however, is that the immersion in Platonism thunders against Romanticism and derides everything that is called projection and labels it idealism, i.e. dawdling. How is Platonism, especially if it is still standing on its head, supposed to recognize itself in what it forgets and never could conceptualize since to it the concept can only be a concept. Forget about that. I'm not going to comment on it. 
Let's go further. This thoughtless thinking of Spangler, oblivious to any danger or plight, could never grasp projection as what originally opens up the truth of being and thus is neither a mere program nor perspective nor a mere floating above life. Projection is an important word in Heidegger's thinking that's linked to his new understanding of what it is to be. And what he's saying is that Spangler cannot understand projection because he can't understand the meaning of being. It's not a question for him. Instead, he treats it as a program, a perspective, some abstract concept. But in order to see project in Heidegger's sense as program, perspective, or a mere abstract ideal or something, you have to be blind to the meaning of being. So this is what Heidegger is saying, okay? Spangler has missed the mark. It's not just that he's following Nietzsche who missed the mark. It's that he's a, he's a cheap version of Nietzsche. He's even further from the mark than Nietzsche might have been. Yet how does it happen that Spangler often does hit the mark in his critique of the times and proceeds so surely in his reproaches? On one hand, proceeding on the basis of such an erroneous misunderstanding of the meaning of being and oblivion to the question itself. And on the other hand, hitting the mark sometimes in his critique. How? Even here, Heidegger writes, Nietzsche is speaking, but again, only a superficial presentation of Nietzsche and never Nietzsche's genuine nihilism, which cannot be severed from his metaphysics and thus from Platonism. Wherever I'm doing this, it's because there are quotation marks in the text and I don't just want to say that every time. The ahistoricality of Spangler, this philosophy of history, is perhaps illustrated by nothing so clearly as by his opinion of having said something about Holderlin, a poet of great importance to Heidegger, as you may know. Heidegger wrote several commentaries and gave several courses on Holderlin's poems. Let me start here again. The ahistoricality of Spangler, this philosophy of history, is perhaps illustrated by nothing so clearly as by his opinion of having said something about Holderlin, when ridiculing the fact that, moreover in a very dubious way, the circle around the poet Stefan George sought in Holderlin an image of the Hellenes instead of affirming Roman civilization. Just leave all of that aside. Yet all misgivings about Spangler carry weight only if we concede that in him a genuine power of his era was put into words. Well, that's not nothing. That's something. This power, despite all the scholarly opposition it endured, has affected precisely those who afterward rejected and believed they, believed they had overcome Spangler's pessimism and his disposition of decline. Even though Spangler had written about the decline of the West, in putting into words the genuine power of his era, he served as a inspiration to a certain extent. You could probably see some of that today in some circles. Spangler helped, even if very superficially, to make available to tradespeople at least a superficies, a superficial presentation of Nietzsche's thinking, that the consequence was a currently all the more assured disdain of philosophy is no wonder, since Spangler is precisely an expression of today's cultural soul and is in comprehension of what eventuated philosophically and metaphysically in Nietzsche's thinking. Let me just explain that briefly. For Heidegger, Heidegger is a philosophical supremacist, philosophy above all, philosophical thinking above all, a certain kind of questioning, a certain orientation, philosophizing. Well, this low-level cultural appropriation of an imitator of Nietzsche that allows us to feel better about the interpretation of ourselves as Roman and uh, the denial of everything else as decayed, it offers something in terms of cultural politics, but it's not philosophizing. It's oblivious to the whole philosophical dimension on which it rests, and it's Doing the thing that for Heidegger is the most important, it's forgetting being. It's abandoned by being. It's not attuned to the meaning of being. And in all of that, it's just a form of cultural politics, which to him is not the nicest thing that you can say about something. So I continue. For this very reason, it is precisely misbegotten, incorrect, to believe Spangler can be disposed of by way of scholarly refutations. He is not to be disposed of as long as the domain of meditation on Nietzsche's thinking is not put forward. 
And without this, the talk of disposing is senseless. So it's not like you're going to have a scholarly refutation of Spangler. You got to get to the underlying basis. The underlying basis is the failed encounter with Nietzsche. Let's say the failed meditate, the, the lack of meditation on Nietzsche. Can anyone know history? Remember, not historiology, history. And even want to speak of it in a binding way, a way that makes a difference and reaches into the root of things and grounds us in that root. Can anyone know history and even want to speak of it in a binding way? If to him, the human being is a zoological greatness, as it is for Spangler. So a crucial closing thought there. If you think the human being is zoological, an animal being, even a rational animal, even the blonde beast, you're never going to get to the realm of binding history because for Heidegger to get to that realm is to overcome the interpretation of man as rational animal or blonde beast. It's to overcome Nietzsche's inverted Platonism. And so those of you who are reading Nietzsche, those of you who are reading Spangler, we now are faced with Heidegger's challenge to all of that. I'm going to pause the video video for a minute because there's something else I want to add about Spangler that just comes to mind. Wait. Okay, so what I've pulled up on screen, well, first I had to grab it off my shelf and then see whether you can find it on Google Books. This is Heidegger's Parmenides. And some of it is on Google Books, including a few passages on Spangler that we might as well read together. So this is from page 56. Let's just go over it. Exclusively on the basis of Nietzsche's metaphysics and without any original metaphysical thought, at the start of the 20th century, the author Oswald Spangler drew up a balance of Western history and proclaimed the decline of the Occident or the decline of the West. Today, as in 1918, when the arrogant book of this title came out, an eager public snaps up only the outcome of the balance without ever considering on which basic ideas of history this cheap balance of decline is concocted. In fact, it had already been reckoned up clearly by Nietzsche, though thought out in a different way and in other dimensions. To be sure, the guild of serious researchers computed the quote-unquote errors of the book. This had the remarkable result that since then, historiography itself has been conducted more and more within the horizon of Spangler's views and schemata, even where it was naturally able to make more correct and more exact constatations. Remember, for Heidegger, the key thing is that Spangler may have set out a framework for the interpretation of facts in which you can go and correct his errors, but the problem, so to speak, is the framework as such. Only to an age which had already forsaken every possibility of thoughtful reflection— Could an author present such a book? That's scathing, isn't it? In the execution of which a brilliant acumen, an enormous erudition, and a strong gift for categorization are matched by an unusual pretension of judgment, a rare superficiality of thinking, and a pervasive frailty of foundations. This confusing semi-scholarship and carelessness of thinking has been accompanied by the peculiar state of affairs that the same people who decry the priority of the biological thinking in Nietzsche's metaphysics find contentment in the aspects of decline in the Spanglerian vision, which is based throughout on nothing but a crude biological interpretation of history. That's our zoological greatness. Modern views of history since the 19th century like to speak about meaning conferral. This term suggests that man on his own is capable of lending a meaning to history, as if man had something to lend out at all, as if history needed such a loan. All of which indeed presupposes that history in itself and at first is... Yeah, all of which indeed presupposes that history in itself and at first is meaningless and in every case has to wait for the favor of a meaning bestowed by man, right? If man confers meaning, then that which he confers meaning on doesn't have it first. Man is such as to be able to confer it and all of that. This is all backwards and messed up for Heidegger. But what man is capable of in relation to history is to pay heed to it. And to take care that history does not conceal from him its meaning and refuse it to him. But as the case of Spangler shows, man has already lost the meaning of history when he has deprived himself of the very possibility of thinking about what, in the hastiness of drawing up historiographical 
storyographical balances, he's investing in the word meaning. We can't even take meaning for granted. What it is to mean is meaning something that we impute. You see, so Spangler is oblivious to this whole realm of questioning, and so are the people who follow him for Heidegger. Meaning is the truth in which a being as such rests. The meaning of history, however, is the essence of truth in which at any time the truth of a human epoch is founded. We experience the essence of the true only on the basis of the essence of truth. I guess I'll say something about that in a minute. Which, in each case, lets something true be the true that it is. We shall attempt here now to take some steps in reflecting on the essence of truth. So to continue that thought, you'd have to continue the Parmenides. I wanted to bring this up as some reflection on Spangler. But while we're here, I'll be really brief about this relationship between truth and the true. I'm going to give you just a rough first approximation and then you can develop it in, uh, at another time through other videos and other courses of mine if you'd like, millermanschool.com. You could see a truth, for example, here's a being, inner worldly being, cup of coffee. Needs a refill. Oh, say that. Cup of coffee. And what I say about it is it needs a refill. In other words, it's empty. There's no coffee in it. My statement about this being is a true statement. But it's a statement about something that's there for me. This cup of coffee or cup with no coffee in it. That's the, uh, the true. Okay, I'm going to just tell you. I'll tell you the distinction. In order for me to say something true, in order for me to have my speech reveal a being in the world as it is, there must be there for me a world in the first place. This openness in which I encounter the cup, without which there cannot be my speaking about the cup, in Heidegger, whether you like it or not, whether it makes sense to you or not, you must begin to grasp this to a certain extent, that openness in which we encounter beings at all and in which there can be true, i.e. revealing statements about states of affairs and things in the world is also called truth. You're in the truth, as it were. This open space is initially related to this truth or essence of truth. And the reason why, and again, you'll see it in the Parmenides and in other books, is because when Heidegger reflected on the Greek word for truth, aletheia, it's roughly like unconcealment, something brought out of concealment, something brought into the open. And therefore, part of the essence of truth for Heidegger, roughly stated, because I didn't even plan to talk about this, is the openness within which anything comes to be. Now, there's another, as it were, part or aspect to the essence of truth, the concealed side. Remember, if aletheia, the Greek word that gets translated eventually as truth, means unconcealment, well, the primary phenomenon is concealment and then being brought out of concealment into the light, into the open or the openness as such. So Heidegger does two things. He orients us towards, he, he does what he calls a... Um, critical reduction from the notion of truth as just a proposition about something in the world to truth as the openness of the world to the aspect of truth that is concealed, self-concealing, withdrawal, refusal, staying away, hiding, as it were. But that's a different story. So I wanted to just go over these passages it's felt like it. Okay, about Spangler. And uh, if you go to the Parmenides and Google Books and you just want a shorthand, whoops, I should see what I have on screen here. What I wanted to show you is that you can just see there are a few other pages in which he talks about Spangler and we're not going to go over them together. I'll leave that for you. I'm Michael Millerman. This is Millerman Talks. See you in the next video.